course, Oppenheimer himself, Killian Murphy. I just want to ask everyone to take it easy on Emily tonight. Don't do it. She had Don't. two colas, which are, I guess, no, Dwayne Johnson's energy drinks. Zoas. Zoas. And then a margarita. So this is like a speed bar. I didn't have two margaritas. She offered me another one, and I said no. Thank you, because I'm a professional. I'm here to talk to you about a very important movie. All right, um, so uh, after that light favor. <laughs> I will say, after that incredible reception, I want to thank you all so much. The reception has been extraordinary, um, and it was, it was, as you say, kind of bizarre. When we, we, we finished the premiere in uh, London, we did the red carpet, and then, you know, we went on strike, so we, it, it, was just, it was just kind of done very abruptly, and then, and then the movie came out, and then it had this amazing uh, response from, from audiences, and so many people went to see it, and, um, and we were all just kind of texting, <laughs> kind of in shock. Um, you know, lots, lots of emojis. Um, uh, so it, it was. Did you send in your Brinks truck emoji? <laughs> when you all are getting close to a billion, I bet. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a it's a thing that it takes a while to kind of process that. I think for all of us, you know, for for Chris, for Emma, for everyone involved in the movie. It's, it, take, it, take, it takes a while, and uh, I think we're still, it's lovely now to come and t t talk to you guys and to be able to interact with audiences and to, to actually be able to sort of uh, process it a little bit. But I, I don't know, I'm still figuring it out, I guess, yeah. It's humble as ever, man. I, I appreciate that. Um, have you all? Uh, Nyack, New York, and we managed to get the two last seats at the IMAX at the um, opening weekend. and. And we went to a 4 p.m. screening when I saw a group of teenagers coming in with pipes dangling out of their mouths dressed as him. I thought that was unbelievable. Wow. And I got goosebumps. It was just, I texted Killian afterwards. I was like, you're not going to believe what I saw. It was just so cool. I had a chance to uh, see it, so I screened it in East Hampton for uh, everyone. Same thing. <laughs> blows doors off Nyack. I mean. <laughs> and I invited everyone that I thought was out there around this time of year and everybody RSVP'd and right before the movie started I sat down and Paul McCartney was sitting next to me and I was watching the movie and also just kind of listening to him breathe for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> you a heavy breather. No, but I, I was attuned to him because, yeah. you know, I thought this might never happen again. Uh, and it was incredible to see this i mean y'all you, you know it just happened to have this communal experience to see something that is so purely cinematic it's just exquisite thank you for saying uh yeah we actually shot that scene in fuller lodge in los alamos uh, in the real uh, environment that those scientists would have been in and socialized in and hung out in and remember we shot there and you could like you know chris did that very deliberately so you know uh, i'm not superstitious guy but i do believe in the you feel the vibrations in the place you feel the, you know the energy in a room and you could there was something about the history of that room so we i remember it wasn't even a full day for that remember we, we did that bit outside first and then we were yeah. it was like a half a day to do that scene and uh i don't think we talked very much about it myself and chris because with those sorts of scenes all you need, really need to do is just think about what happened, you know, what actually happened. And, and then the, it, it, I was very aware that at that point it was like about the um, the dilemma and the conflict and the contradiction and all of those things that he was trying to trying to uh, um, deal with. Um, and so we didn't. We just we shot it really quickly. And the, 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 I remember the, the the extras were f fucking fantastic. That they were. Uh, there were actually not extras, there were a lot of actors and just, um, they were really giving in the scene and um, I don't know, we just did, we just did it. But like, like sometimes with those things, there's, the themes are so huge and the dilemmas are so huge, you, you just have to think about it, you don't really have to talk about it. Well again, it was, um, it was breathtaking. And I thought that was so careful it because... It opens and it says, um, it says fission and it intros uh, our hero. 
and it says <laughs> fusion, and it intros Strauss and, and his point of view. Um, I just remember that day we're at the Bataan Memorial uh, building in Santa Fe, and uh, I think it was the first day. I think might have, might have been the first thing we shot anyway. So I was kind of in my body and just trying to establish something. And I was realizing, you know, as, as we all did, the way what his rhythms are and the way he works, and it's so efficient that the only thing that could, that could possibly go wrong is you. <laughs> and it was, it was good, you know, we know all that one. It's, a, it's mortifying to start sometimes, and then, but like my missus always says, you know, once the first clapper goes, half your problems go away because the anticipation is gone and you're in it. But I'm glad you noticed that first scene because it is so critical. And, and great directors know that a character's introduction is the only thing you have to get right. Mm -hmm. And it I is think it, look, it was a fantastic setup, I realize, because at that point she's so unpredictable and volatile and um, dangerous potentially and um, uh, has lost dignity and people's belief in her other than his. And I love that they've walked through fire together and that he does believe in her. And, you know, I remember reading that in the script that she's not quite walking in a straight line going in there, you know. And amazing Jason Clark, I just have to like give props to like him, it's just the most um, ferocious, intimidating prosecutor who we loathe so much by the time she comes in that you just need someone to come in and rip the face off him. You're just desperate for someone to do it and no one's really fighting for him. And um, clearly uh, she's a character who doesn't care at all what anybody thinks of her. And she's, I found her so lethal and I really loved that scene because it's sort of a reclamation of that brilliant brain that went to waste at the ironing board, probably. Mm. And, um, you know, you kind of want to see her come back to life and fight for him convincingly, because everyone else has sort of towed the line. Um, so it was an amazing setup and um, really fun to do it, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, empathize with her, I think so many women um, at that time had to kind of contort themselves into being something that was um, so out of character, out of nature. She was a terrible mother and uh, n and certainly didn't subscribe to good housekeeping, you know, it was just <laughs> um, not built for it, you know, and kind of driven mad in that isolation and loneliness of Los Alamos. I did admire her. I mean, certainly a non-conformist. I mean, he's her fourth husband by the time she's 29, so. She's going there. <laughs> oh God, it's one of those questions. Uh, I genuinely didn't feel that much kind of connected to Shu with the character. I don't, I don't think you need to have that. Me, personally, I don't think I need to have that. And it, I don't think uh, there has to be that sort of exchange for me. Uh, and it was like, I, I really, when I read it, and he sent it to me, I went, holy fucking shitballs. Like, I, I, I don't really know what, how, how to do this. Like, I genuinely didn't know how to do this. Um, but we, like, we had a long time. I think he, Chris says in his very kind of offhandish way, you know, I was, <laughs> I was <laughs> writing the script and he, and he had the book the, beside him. And apparently there was some physical resemblance. Uh, so there was that, I guess, but other than that, no, like, I mean, uh, he, 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 he's an astonishing, uh, never to be seen again um, individual. You know, a lot of his contemporaries would say that he was the most brilliant of them all, like beyond Einstein and all that. Do you know, you know, so you're talking about a man that, like, that brain that could never, will never, it's one, one in a million. Uh, so. Well, then what part of it? Well, I would say, what part of it did you find maybe the most difficult to sort of access in your instrument? I think I found him intensely human. Mm. Do you know? That's what people ask me about him. They go, he was intensely, relatably human. Aside from all his genius and his flaws and his contradictions, he still was naive. Mm -hmm. You know, he still believed after that, how it happened in 45, that there would be, that, that, that this, 
there would be a world governance and that this genocidal weapon would be managed and that all the all nations would come together and would have common sense and that there would you know that he could still that be that brilliant to think that and that's intensely human you know so that i connected to and uh, you know the relationship you never know what goes on in any relationship nobody ever knows but there was some beautiful interdependence or sort of symbiosis that they kept these two together forever and it's sustained and that scene you were just talking about you know this is, this, i love that scene so much because it shows how much they cared for each other even though they probably never said it i mean i, I don't, they probably never had articulated it so uh that was my kind of way in that he was a human being it certainly wasn't the physics <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> mr robert Dunn. And you know, when you get a, a role or a film and it's out and you're talking about it or even years later, it's a lifelong kind of like talisman that you can keep going back to. So I was even, I literally, yesterday I just Googled Salieri and he, when, when Mozart did Don Giovanni, Salieri had put out an opera that was actually better reviewed. And history doesn't care about that because it's decided that it was black and white. And so I think also just like, and Nolan in making that reference, he was inviting us to see, well, there's the Milos Forman version, the historical version, and now there's the revised history that we actually know more about the way we were taught incorrectly about what it was. And I think you can say the same thing about the atomic age, and you can say the same thing about when political um, preferences become too extreme, Strauss, particularly conservative, Oppenheimer, possibly a bit too progressive, um, that it just doesn't serve the people because if they could have met in the middle of the aisle, then Adams for Peace might have happened and perhaps Strauss would have said, hey, you're acknowledging me. What is it that you want to do? Okay, let me show you how to deal with the UN. Let me show you how to deal with Truman. He's tricky, but I can help you. So I think that it is, as Nolan has said, it was a bit of a horror movie. I think it's a history and it's also, a, it's, a, it's a tragedy that and it's something that we can do We can do better. Just because they are geniuses and special, we hold as the greatest generation, whatever. We're the greatest generation now. It's our job to try to, to you know, do things a little better. I don't think you told me about whether or not you think that they that he loves him in the inside, though. Just a little bit. I, or if you think... I, I, think, there was, I think there was animus. Because if the first... I, it was always this thing about, you know, there's, there's the three insults. There's... The insult that the heart of the movie is is the is the is the rob interrogation that you turn around on him and you realize that she will love and tolerate you forever and she'll have your back because at that point you don't know who's against you mm -hmm. but i think the bookends between the heart of the movie are these implied insults or slights and how petty mm. everyone can be what's not petty is what happens there yeah. that's love that's beautiful the rest of the stuff is you know so there's that one, there's the time when the isotopes, you give me crap about that, and then the final straw is when you blow off my daughter at my birthday party. <laughs> because you're bummed out that things didn't go your way. See, I'm almost feeling like straw. Because <laughs> this is what we do, right? We take on the mantle of, I have to be in the point of view of that person fully. And I have to fully see, I have to fully be in their shoes, even if I'm nothing like them. And that's the great gift we get, is we get to with this forced perspective that is not our own, which is, I think, why Killian, you know, and every day he said, oh, I just I don't know what I'm doing. And then he would go do something so hard, so well. So I mean, our, our host was basically saying, I don't have to know to do this well. I just have to, you know, I have to be in these shoes. And, and you know, yeah. I learned on the first round of this press. I think Killian, I think this is one of the most sublime performances I've ever seen. I think it's utterly riveting. I think all of his wonderful mercurial qualities lent itself to this ambiguity that you get kidnapped by this character, not just because of his ocean eyes, but because of his New hashtag. Extraordinary. <laughs> New TikTok, guys. Um, but because of his extraordinary abilities that are um, kind of meteoric. And I was so lucky to, it's the second time I've worked with him, 
he is my favorite scene partner fact it's true and it, it, it was just a joy it was a joy we could jetpack in and out and get lots of breaks in between and i can't believe the burden and the monumental task um of what he had to take on for this and he held all of us together every day and i remember downey saying to chris nolan you you're so lucky to have someone like him that comes in every day and is as kind and warm as he is but as prepared and is sublime you know it's so unusual to have that in the theater and it's all so small and you're doing it for the love of the game and you do it for the 240 whatever the minimum is and you're lucky if there's an equity cot there's that's this felt like because Nolan is so Spartan um, and then you're the focus of this Spartan important thing he's doing. But to me, the biggest sacrifice is we know all those things and actors usually love to, you, you're, you haven't loved to do it, but love to talk about everything they had to do with their diet and their regimen and how they slept in a coffin and you know, it's like, <laughs> but, um, but what I saw was the struggle within you every day to give yourself permission to play someone so completely different from you in that you're very engaging and very conscious and very polite and very thoughtful. And this guy is in his own world. So I think the first time you just have to let your, your scene partners know, hey, I, it's not that I don't like you and I don't care about you. Clearly it's the character I'm doing. And then you wouldn't overcompensate, but it was almost like you had to, in every frame of this, you had to go to a place that is not your nature because it was the nature of what you were trying to portray. And I think that, to me, that was the real hat trick because it's lonely, dude. It's lonely yes. to have had to yes. have done that on top of everything else. And yes. I think that's the weird thing. You're number one on the call sheet, you're in every frame, and in a way, you're in this really kind of like um, solo, Free solo type weirdo place, you know. And then I saw you, I saw you, I saw you manage it and survive it, and that's why, that's why you're, you're really quite good at this, brother. Yeah. <laughs> to, to witness. But these, these, no, but these guys just, you know, the reason why I think the film works is because you have the best fucking actors in the world. In the yeah. I was literally gonna ask you this, yeah. literally. So let me let me save you right this, because this is what I knew. I knew he was gonna. Guys in particular, you know, because you know I had so much stuff with these two guys, and like the, the the work, you can see it. You just saw it. It's just astonishing what 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 they did. You know, it's you're, it's kind of imprinted on your psyche. These two characters in this in this movie, and the skill and the dexterity and the nuance they give to these. But that's a given, I think. We all know the, about these actors for years and years. They're just legends. But for me, it was also just the kindness and the empathy and the humanity that they showed me during the shooting of the thing. Because it was, it, was, it, was, it was tough. I mean, it was, it, was, it was fast, but it was furious and it was tough. But it was just this huge empathy and kindness. And being in scenes with these guys, and I think you all know this when you're making a scene, it's never about the actors, it's about making the best scene possible, making the most truthful, most honest work you could possibly do, and that's what you get from actors of this, this caliber, and, and I felt really held and secure and safe working with these guys all the way through it, not just on set, but off set, and that's the gift.